why didn't you give this to me? I thought I deserved this. I thought I was good. I thought I was enough for you. I thought this was what I was entitled to for, for being the Christian that, that you wanted me to be. I was 13 years old doing my favorite thing in the world at the time, playing basketball. The game was on Sunday after church, and I was just killing it on the court. I was loving my time on there until I got to the free throw line. <laughs> and all of a sudden, things weren't too hot. I missed two free throws. I went back to the bench, and coach was not happy with me. Thankfully, that game, a lot of my other teammates, they were missing free throws as well. And I remember it was the practice after that that our coach drilled into our minds that we have to spend more time on the fundamentals if we want to be a good team. We have to spend more time focusing on our free throws. That way we can take advantage of the points and get get the advantage in the game and really get the result that we all wanted, which was the championship at the end of the year. Now, this kind of mentality is something that resonated with me. You put in the work, you get the result that you're looking for. If you don't put in the work, then there's no expectation and there's no thought that, hey, I'm going to get what I want out of this. Now, when I became a Christian at around that time of my life, I took that same philosophy into my Christian walk. If you put in the amount of work and effort into it, you're going to get out a good result. I had expectations on God. If you would ask me, Isaac, what do you expect God to do for you? I would say, well, I guess I accept, expect him to save me of my sins because that's what he said he would do. I expect him to um, love me because that's something that he said he would do for me. Beyond that, you know, I expect him to show me his grace because he's given me himself and, and all that kind of thing. But if you were to dig a little bit deeper and you were to say, Isaac, are you sure there's no more expectations that you have on God? I would say, no, no, no. You know, we're not guaranteed, you know, perfect life or anything. We're not just guaranteed a smooth road, you know, and, and, and the Christian life is hard. So, you know, we just need to cling to God. And, and that's, that's what he guarantees us. He actually guarantees us trials and tribulations sometimes. I would even say that. Um, but the truth was, in my heart, and maybe you've had a similar experience, though you can verbalize all these things, you still have expectations on God in your subconscious, whatever it is that you're holding God to. Now, we know God's sovereign. We know he's in control. But at the end of the day, we think that if we put in the necessary components to our Christian walk and to our Christian faith and to our life, if we do it the right way, then God will see that and he will bless us with what we want. It fits right into our individualistic hustle culture mentality in the Western culture. You think about it. It's like, I'm going to put my life on hold and I'm going to hustle towards this thing that I really want in order that the results will fall in my favor. And I'll get what I've always wanted. I'll get the house. I'll get the marriage. I'll get the business. I'll get the the money. I'll get the popularity, whatever it is, because I put in the work. That feeds us. It makes us feel like we are in control. I don't know about you guys, but even when I'm in that mentality and when I have been in that mentality in the past, past, I tend to compare myself to other people. I'm looking to the side and saying, man, they're working harder than me. Man, they're being a better Christian than me. They're evangelizing more than me. Now, in my heart, what I want it to be is to be like, wow, that's awesome. They evangelize. That's so cool. That's amazing. Another person, uh, you know, a seed planted. That's, that's great. But for a long time, what was in my heart was, man, they're being such a good Christian. I'm sure God loves them a lot, probably more than me, because they do a lot more for him than I do. And I'm sure down the line that'll pay off for them. God will bless them with a lot of things and a lot of things that they want because they're being such a good Christian. This kind of thinking may just seem crazy to you if you grew up in the church. If you grew up in evangelical circles where, you know, we're constantly pounded on by, guys, this isn't just about getting what you want. It's not just about, you know, trying to, it's not the prosperity gospel here. We're against the prosperity gospel. Uh, this is about just, you know, wanting to serve God and, and kind of just give yourself to him and submit yourself to him. But here I am in my heart, really not buying into that. Then I would fall into sin, sometimes dive right into sin for a season of time. And I would feel so guilty and ashamed and I'm like, wow, I'm so far behind. And it wasn't necessarily even like sometimes, man, I'm sinning against God. It's more like, man, I'm really not being a good Christian here. It was much more out of reaching this specific 
measure that I had an expectation of myself of what I needed to be versus the God that I was actually sinning against. The subtext here is I need to keep pushing. I need to keep working. I need to get up in order for God to love me, in order for me to get the things that I want to get from God, in order for other people to love me within the church, within Christianity. I want to be somebody that's seen as good, as responsible, as holy, as uh, mature in their faith. I want all these things, but I was falling short. At this point, you're looking at my story and you're thinking, man, Isaac, how far have you fallen from the true gospel? You're believing all these lies, all these crazy things. How does your mind get to this place? Well, I'm sure there's others out there that you can testify with, with me too. It's, it's not that hard of a jump to say, man, I need to do these things in order to gain this love. Because, hey, guys, the truth is we were made for love. We were made to receive love. We were made to give love. We were made to be in perfect community and connection with God, who is the ultimate definition of love. In the garden, it was perfect love. It was perfect security. It was perfect significance. But when that broke off, all of a sudden we're looking for all these other places. Like, how can I be filled? How can this need in my soul be filled? And we think we can get there by doing enough and being enough. And so some people, the truth is, some people, they play this game. They play this game of what can I do so I can get from God? And it pans out for them. It, it pans out for them. They get the house. They get the job. They get the ministry. They get the life that they wanted. They get the family. And it works. And they come out and they say, hey, guys, like, if you do these things, if you work this hard, if you love God, then you know what? Like, I'm not saying you're going to get all this stuff, but there's a good chance you might. And here we are like, okay, that's what I want. Here's the trouble. Here's when your faith gets shaken is when you run on this presumption your whole life and then you encounter something that you can't reverse. Maybe it's something you did. Maybe it's something somebody else did. A broken dream, a loss of a loved one, something that shakes you so hard, something so significant in your life where you know, okay, um, I can't fix this. And in a lot of ways, this isn't fixable. This is something that has happened. It's done. And I can't change it. And I'm kind of angry at God because I thought, God, if I did the stuff that I was supposed to do, then God would say, oh, my beloved child, of course, I want to give this to you. Of course, I want to offer you exactly what you've always wanted. Of, co of course, I want to give you what you've always dreamed for. So what happens when that's taken away from you? What happens when that's ripped from your hands? Guys, I'm going to be honest with you. In a lot of ways, I resonate with that person a lot more. That person that says, God, wh wh what happened? Um, I, I thought I was doing the right thing. I thought I was doing things the right way. So why didn't it pay off the way that I thought it was going to? God, are you even there? Do you even care about me? And some pastors will come on here and they'll say, you know what, that trial, that struggle, that, uh, that loss in your life, God is preparing you for something. He's preparing you for something. And so it's hard now, but God's preparing you. He's going to do something in your life. Maybe he's even going to give it to you later on when you're actually ready for it. What I say to those pastors, I say maybe. But a lot of these losses, guys, you can't bring a loved one back to life. Some of these things you can't reverse. That's the truth of it. The hurt, the trauma, the pain, whatever it is, the loss, you can't reverse these things necessarily, right? What's happened has happened. So what do we do with this? Do we say God's just preparing me for something? God's going to use this in my life? Well, yeah, he will. But I think a lot of times our, our minds are focused outward. We're focused back on the work. We're like, okay, God's, God's going to do something in my life. And he's going to use this pain and this struggle and this trial so then I can be a, a better missionary for God. So I can be a better worker for him. So I can be a better soldier for the kingdom. But meanwhile, God's looking at you and he's saying, you're, you're missing the point. Because you're going back to the same coping mechanism that you used before. 
when you encountered something hard, when you encountered a trial, when you encountered a dream, you were like, let me work for this. Let me fix this. Let me try to gain control of this so then it can be better. So I can be happy. So it can be good. So I can get what I want. So I can please God. So I can be good. So he can love me. <sighs> Meanwhile, God is looking at you again and he's saying, Isaac, I'm not concerned with all these things that you can do for me. I want you to glorify me, but how do you do that? Friend, what I'm coming to terms with is that the primary way that we glorify God is not through what we are doing, trying to be a good Christian, trying to do all these things, but it's our relationship with God. It's about being satisfied in Him. Now, friends, it sounds maybe too easy. Maybe it sounds too small, too simple, but it is the hardest and most challenging endeavor that you'll ever encounter. God is most glorified in us when we are most satisfied in him. <laughs> in a lot of ways, I was using God. I was trying to manipulate my way to the top. I was trying to manipulate what my way into getting the life that I wanted, that I thought I deserved by being that good kid, by being that good Christian kid. I'm not going to rebel. I'm not going to do these things because I love you, God. But I also think down the line that you're going to bless me with something really good. And that's in my mind too. Here's my question for you. What happens when God doesn't give you what you want? He's inviting you on a journey. And it's a journey to know him in a way that few people ever get to know him. For those people that it all works out for them, <laughs> they need, never need to dig beyond the surface of what God is inviting us into. Yeah, I'm a good Christian. I'm a good guy. Yeah, Jesus died for my sins, but you know what? Like, that's awesome and that's great. And I'm going to show up to church and, uh, you know, read my Bible occasionally, but otherwise my life is great. For those of you who've encountered a trial, a struggle, something so difficult in your life that has shaken you, maybe in this moment you're feeling shaken to your core. Your faith is, is there, but it's small. It's like mustard seed right now. <laughs> Will you respond to God in anger? Will you respond to God in, God, why didn't you give this to me? I thought I deserved this. I thought I was good. I thought I was enough for you. I thought this was what I was entitled to for, for being the Christian that, that you wanted me to be. Are you going to respond like that? Or are you going to realize the truth? The truth is, is that it wasn't about all this stuff. No, it wasn't. It wasn't about that good life. It wasn't about getting that car or that marriage or that life or that job or the prestige or the, the money. It was about knowing God. <laughs> and maybe about, maybe all this other stuff, all this time has been an idol, has been something that I've been striving towards. I've been trying to use God to get to. Meanwhile, God is like, pay attention to me. I'm the point. I'm the point. I'm what this thing is all about. I'm everything you could have ever wanted and ever needed. In, only, in me, can you only be satisfied? In me, you can find everlasting life. I am Lilith living water where you will never thirst again. I, guys, I got to be honest with you. This is where I'm at, where I'm like, God, am I really going to let go of this maybe bitterness and anger towards God for things that haven't happened in my life that I want them to happen? Am I going to let go of these feelings of, of just, of, uh, this isn't just God. I thought I was good. I thought I was, I thought you were going to give me this stuff. Or am I going to say, God, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I want to be like it says in Philippians. This is a powerful verse, guys. This is what Paul says here in Philippians 3.8. It says, Indeed, I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. For this, for his sake, I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ. You're in this place where you, <laughs> you thought you, you were obligated to get some things from God and God has turned up empty. And you're questioning, is God even real? Does God love me? Does God... Guys, God right now is demonstrating to you his ultimate sign of love. And that is tearing away the old foundation of what you used to be standing on. 
the old ways of doing things, the old ways of thinking, I'm going to do this to get this, this transactional relationship, and God is ushering you into a new place. It hurts. <laughs> it does hurt because it's not the way what we're used to. But it's better. It's to say, like Paul says, I count everything as rubbish compared to knowing Christ. Compared to knowing Christ. Man, some people say, God, you can take everything from me. You can take everything from me and I'll still be satisfied with you. I'll still love you more than anything and I'll be happy and I'll, I'll be happy in, in, you know, on the streets and, and wherever just because I have you and I don't need any of this. Big talk. What happens when something significant ta gets taken away? That's when it becomes real. That's when we're forced to say, God, all those big words I was saying before, I don't know if I can do that. I don't know if you're enough for me, but I want you to be. I want to be there. I want to trust you, but I'm struggling. Friends, I want you to know that God is with you in this time. He understands that you're disappointed. He understands that you're heartbroken. He understands that, that the system that you were working out of, it's proven faulty to you, and that's just that's awful. It feels awful, but it is better because our hearts and our minds are having to focus and surrender to God, maybe for the first time to say, you know what, God, I said I surrendered to you, but I was actually clinging on to all this stuff. And now that it's all gone, <laughs> I, guess, I guess I'm forced to say, God, I really, you are really enough for me. You are really what I need. You are really the only one I can rely on. All this other thing, stuff I relied for significance and security and love. Ah, it was nothing. It was nothing. I hope you got something from this video. I hope it testified to your heart because I know this is something that's weighed heavy on mine. Thank you to everyone who supports me on Patreon. Uh, we're going to have some updates on Patreon in the coming weeks and months that are going to spice it up a little bit. Um, so thank you to everyone who's joining on there too. This is my full-time gig. This is how I support my family. This is what I'm passionate about. This is my mission in my life and sharing Jesus online. And so if that's something that you want to support, that would be an amazing thing. Uh, a lot of people in my space try to create courses and stuff like that that they're trying to sell to people. It just becomes really icky for me and I I don't want to be in that place. So it'd be just amazing if I could offer everything for free and I'm able to do that by the patrons on Patreon. So enough of that. Thank you for watching guys. I love you and God bless.